there's going to be people watching at home that are in similar circumstances thinking, if I only knew somebody, yes. if I only had capital yes. available, right. you didn't know anybody, didn't know anybody. you put it all on the line, and you went for it. That's Thank the American you. dream, and that's, that's exactly why we do this show. Welcome to the Shark Tank Podcast. Each week, one of the best entrepreneurs from ABC's network smash hit Shark Tank teaches you how to swim with the sharks without being eaten alive. And now your host, serial entrepreneur, T.J. Hale. Yo, Shark Traps, what's up? This is TJ. Thank you so much for jumping into the podcast. Amazing podcast session today. My guests are Jason and Michelle, the co-founders and co-creators of the Twin Z Pillow. I know, Jason, maybe I'm giving you too much credit. That's kind of a general meme of the show, but you guys are both awesome and the show is excellent. So if you thought the same thing that I did, gentlemen, when you saw them on Shark Tank and thought, eh, I'm not really much of a breastfeeder. If you are, that's cool. No judgment, but I'm not. So I'm thinking, what am I going to get out of the segment? What can I learn from this? Well, let me tell you, if you've created a product, if you've had a desire to build a million dollar company on social media using almost no advertising, and if you really would love to find those, what the meme going out right now by guys like Jeff Goins is that the loyal 10, 1000 fans, like the 1000 loyal fans that can help your company do anything and be anything. Well, that's what Jason and Michelle have done. They built a community of supporters around not only this product, but around this entire idea of having twins, of raising twins, of the fears and the surprises and the the unplanned uh, ordeals of having two kids at once. So we joke on the podcast that they should write the Twins for Dummies yellow book you can buy at Barnes & Noble because that's what their community is. It just so happens they have the best product on the market, the Twinsy, and now other products are forthcoming like the Onesie, which is a more you know ubiquitous product on the market. So a lot of great stuff. We're going to talk about the idea of going retail versus staying niched online plus Amazon, which was a central theme of the Shark Tank segment that they had on TV. We're going to talk about how to double your company every nine months, which is what they've done. We're going to talk about the online community they built and how they've nourished it and grown it and scaled it so that you can do the same. And we're also going to, an amazing admission from Michelle, we're going to talk about what their one big regret was after they went on Shark Tank and what they would do differently. A little more honest than I'm used to getting after someone goes on Shark Tank, and I think you'll enjoy that. So sit back, relax. Before we start, I want two things I got to tell you. One, I'm going to an event tonight where Kevin O'Leary might show up. Most of his team is going to be there. And I got invited by some business colleagues. Robert Herjavec's partner is going to be there. I haven't been on social media much because I've just been way too busy, but I'll probably share some pictures from that event and we can talk about it. And at the time that this airs, I'm hoping my Mr. Wonderful t-shirts will be available for you to purchase online. I was really had my fingers crossed that the next time I saw Kevin, I'd have the shirt ready so he could see it, but I'll have to wait till the following time. If it turns out though, because I got some of the designs coming back to me this week and I like it and I make them, I'll put them online. And if you want one, you can purchase one. I think they're going to sell like hotcakes because they're super awesome. I've been thinking about doing this for a while, but I'm not in the t-shirt business. So it's kind of a little side project. No sponsor for today's show, but it just means I have an opportunity to thank you for joining me today. Thank you for always being supportive and checking out these amazing stories that we get to share only on the Shark Tank podcast. And I would appreciate it if while you're listening to this, if you think of someone who's running a business, if they're in a similar position, if they love Shark Tank, or if they just need to be picked up by an inspirational story to inspire them to go on and do great things, do me a favor and share this, send them a link, tell them about the Shark Tank podcast and bring them into the fold. Prepare to have your mind blown. Let's do this. I think you should put their deals in your mental shredder. Gone. I would agree with that one. Hey, everybody. Thanks for jumping into the Shark Tank podcast. Really exciting discussion today. My guests are Michelle and Jason Barsoski. I knew I was going to say that wrong. Barsoski or Barsoski? <laughs> Michelle, help me out. Barsoski. Okay. Barsoski. I, I spelled it right and said it wrong. Dang it. <laughs> but the name of the company is the Twin Z Company. They appeared on season six of Shark Tank, and they basically created a feeding frenzy over their twinner breastfeeding pillow that Michelle had essentially invented and sold herself and turned into a six-figure business in a short amount of time. So I want to welcome you both to the show. Thanks for jumping in. Thank you. Thank you. Is this normally a togetherness activity, or is that just because we had this chat scheduled and you want to be in the same vicinity? Oh, yeah. No, no. We're, we're very rarely together during the day. <laughs> so this is just for you. <laughs> oh, wow. That's nice. 
So uh, are you from, I remember Amherst from the clip. Are you from Maryland? I uh, know Amherst, New Hampshire. And, and now we're down in North Carolina where our manufacturing is now. No kidding. Your business made you pick up and move. When did that happen? Yeah, well, we kind of wanted that. We kind of directed it that way. Um, I went to North Carolina State University, so I always wanted to kind of come back. And the winters are very long in, in New Hampshire, so this was kind of the goal. And and uh, I have great manufacturers down here. It's worked out really well for us. Excellent. Do you know Julie from Slossa? You and Julie Boucher buddies by yes, chance? Yes, I do. Yes, yes. We had lunch uh, probably a week and a half ago. She's a machine, a business machine. She is. She's fantastic. I love her, yeah. She, she was bolted together, manufactured from spare parts from other business magnates. She's something Yeah, else. she's awesome. So what about you, Jason? Where are you from originally? Are you from New Hampshire? I am not. I was sort of a Navy brat. I lived all over the world. Um, but most of my life, probably from the age of 10 on, was in New England. Uh, so uh, a Boston boy moved up to New Hampshire to save on some taxes. And then uh, very happy to be in the South, though, because those winters are pretty brutal. Yeah, yeah. So a couple things about that. One, how about those Patriots? Are you... A f- <laughs> Is that a sore subject are, right now? Doing, they're doing quite well, except for the last two weeks. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we won't talk about that. They're still, they still have the same record as the Cardinals. As long as you're not doing worse than my Cardinals, everything's yes, okay. Absolutely. Uh, for people listening to this later, the Patriots are on their first two game losing streak since the, uh, I think, since the AFL <laughs> NFL merger. <laughs> It's hard to win when you don't have any wide receivers on the field. Yeah, when Tom Brady's making open field tackles, you know something's not right. Hopefully they clean up their ass. Tom, Tom, Tom Brady has more uh, receiving yards than a lot of the wide receivers out there right now. <laughs> he does. It's funny <laughs> watching Tom Brady run. Uh, you, did you? Okay, one thing about the play where he caught that pass, you, the corner gave yeah. him too much respect, in my opinion. Like, if I'm a corner, I'm new in the league, I'm thinking, Tom Brady, I'm going to tear his head off. But all those guys were kind of like, all right, Tom, just kind of merge out of bounds, if you would. Make this easier exactly. on yourself. Right, right. I always wonder. I'm like, it runs the, better than Drew Bledsoe, though. I can tell you that. That's probably true. I just wonder if the coach was like, I don't care who he is. Hit him. Or if they said, you know what? That's fine. This is the NFL. I'm surprised they didn't, they didn't take him out pretty hard. Yeah. I'm like, why don't you just merge? So, all right, we got the background on the two of you. Now, your segment was awesome. For people who don't remember season six, I think it was episode 21, you came in with the Twin Z pillow, and it's essentially this very cool-looking pillow that's made specifically for moms that are breastfeeding twins. When I saw it, yeah, I actually... Breast- breastfeeding and bottle feeding. Yeah. Breast- okay, breastfeeding and bottle feeding. Thank you for the clarification. Sorry, I saw sorry. it and actually <laughs> thought there's probably a lot of cool things I could do with this too as a dad. It's kind of like a miniature love sack with some contour in it. It's got three legs, so it probably stands up on its own. I, my mind started wandering yeah. of all the utilitarian purposes. But in general, I just thought it was a really cool product. And then you wowed everyone and said, yeah, we're on track for 500000 in sales. And it seemed like the business was fairly new. But I don't recall if you'd already been in business for a few years or 18 months. Or kind of give us the background on the time frame of this. Yeah, we were um, – when we taped that, we were in business for two – Two years. Two, two and a half years. Started yep. 2012. 2012, yep. And then that year we were on track to do 570, but but we far surpassed that. Um, that year, we are actually our estimate was to hit around uh, one to 1.2 for the following 12 months, right after the Shark Tank right. year. All right. So before you kind of give us the skinny on the numbers, there was something that happened during your show that I thought was great. When Mark Cuban essentially gave you the ovation, even though he went out, he gave you a lot of compliments about the kind of entrepreneurs that you are. So we need to tell the backstory. You had a an intro segment which was awesome, but then you talked about being in the pharmaceutical industry together getting laid off. And I thought it was really funny, Jason, when you said we had no phones, we had no cars, because when you're a medical sales rep, they basically hook you up, right? You have everything you need. You have the bat belt of every possible tool. Absolutely. You That's, you sort of, you sort of are in this little bubble when you're in, when you're in the outside sales like that. So you don't realize that, you know, when that goes away, you have to buy a car, you have to buy a phone, you have to buy a computer. I mean, uh, it, it's quite shocking. When that I used to work for the Phoenix Suns. I used to dunk off the trampolines with the gorilla, which is not really a job, but I did it. And uh, <laughs> one of the guys got this. Is, it just totally came out of nowhere. It reminded me of this. We had a, an event, and one of the guys mouthed off to the boss and said something you shouldn't have. Right? I forget what it was, and but I remember that he had to go upstairs, and he came back down, and he said they tried to take my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> same thing like they give us all of our clothes all of our shoes they give us everything we wear all season long because they try to they try to make me walk downstairs barefoot so that's what oh i thought my of. God. oh my god that's too funny so anyway hopefully you didn't have to go out and buy new shoes too but no no that, that guy's actually my own shoes. that guy's actually the son's gorilla now i had to uh, buy new pants though you have to get new pants 
So <laughs> you were in this position where you had no income. You guys are in the same industry, which is always a little scary, right? Like I have a lot of friends who are both in re- the spouses are both in real estate. And that's pretty nerve wracking yeah. when things go south because you're both on the same boat. So you had this whole aura of no money, no job, not sure what to do next. Take us through the genesis of how the company actually started and how terrified you were that you were going to have to like live in a homeless shelter afterwards. I mean, wh- how yeah. real was that? <laughs> yeah, it actually, it actually was very terrifying. We had our, um, our VP of sales actually called us during the layoffs because our situation was so unique that he was basically, you know, killing two incomes in one family at a time. And so it, it was really, it was really devastating, but we had, we did have severance packages, which was nice. So we had a small amount of time to kind of pull it all together, but Jason actually went back to cleaning cars with he had done in, in high school with a friend of his. And, um, he ended up getting a great job in medical device, which was a huge blessing. And, um, it was a great opportunity for me to, you know, decide to, you know, to actually go forward and patent the pillow. And, um, I had talked about doing it, but really didn't have the opportunity. So we basically just cashed in my 401k and just kind of decided to take a leap of faith. And, uh, and that's kind of how it started. It basically started in my business, in my basement and I was cutting and sewing them, stuffing them, shipping them. And, um, I did it all myself until I got to the point where I was like, you know what, I've got to find manufacturing and, and I always say that's the, the, you know, the hardest thing in this whole process was finding good manufacturing. Oh, no doubt. But that's kind of how we, we came to, to where, we, where we began. All right. So I have two questions. One, had you already made the first pillow like years earlier and it was just sitting there and people would compliment it and this idea was effervescing? Or did you make it and within a couple months you had made 10 and then 20 and then now all of a sudden you're going, hey, I might have something here. Like which, which group were you in? Which camp? I made it when the girls uh, were little, tiny, tiny. And I basically was just trying to find somewhere to put them at the same time and with with twins you know you can always with one baby you can hold the baby and you know do something else with the other hand but with twins there's nowhere to put two babies and do something else at the same time so they were too little for bouncy chairs and you know there, there, was, there was really nothing so i i went on the internet and i was like there really has got to be a product out there and there really wasn't so i basically just sat down and drawled it out drew it out on a on a piece of cardboard cut it out, sewed it, stuffed it, and I literally took it everywhere with me. We would take it down to the beach, we'd take it to the lake, we'd take it everywhere. And that's when people would see, and they were like, oh my gosh, that's such a great idea, you should patent it. And, you know, that's kind of how it came about. So I had had already been using it for a long time by the time I decided to go forward. I'm just picturing a car commercial where you replace the family dog with, like, the family pillow, and it's just everywhere. Right, right. You do what you can do when you have twins, you know? <laughs> on, our, on our Facebook page, someone had sent a picture of them. They were at a rest area, and they had their tailgate open with the pillow there with the babies on the tailgate. <laughs> yes, the yes. How great is it? I want to yeah. talk about your community, and we'll we'll get into that later, but I just think how great is it to have people sharing those experiences together and, and validating the fact that you've got something really solid here. I love that. I love the online community aspect of business. It is. The other question I had regarding manufacturing is at what point, how many were you sewing a day? How many hours were you not sleeping before you said, you know what, Jason, I can't sew another one of these. Like, we have to find someone to make these for you. Like, how many could you create in a day? If you're the sweatshop I, girl I was doing, you're... so when I started, I would do like one a month, two a month, you know, and then it came up to a couple a week. And then when I got up to two a day, the kids were still little and I was working all the time. He would come home from his job and basically I would work all night making these pillows, stuffing them, you know, boxing, bagging them, shipping them, everything. So two a day was my breaking point. I was done and I couldn't do anything else, social media or anything like that because I was just really trying to produce them. So it was probably one and a half pillows is where we kind of started looking for manufacturing and it really took about, I don't know, six to six or seven months to find manufacturing in the U S we had attempted China for a little bit, but it just, it was not the direction. We were still really small and, um, and it just, it took us a long time to find manufacturing in the U S we've probably gone through in the, in the early going, we probably went through three different manufacturers, three or four different manufacturers. Yeah. Cause we were, we were small and some of the, Big pillow manufacturers in the U.S. are gigantic pillow manufacturers, so there's not a lot of things in between. 
um, where you can get a lot more options if you go over to China. Yeah, I think people underestimate how difficult it is, though, as a new company to manage that. I mean, China, the reputation China has for not making good products, it's gone. I mean, most of the a lot of the great stuff that we use every day is made in China, but managing it, traveling there, inspecting the facilities, getting to know them, the language barrier, like right. you can't do that as a small company unless you have someone you know who's there on the ground. It's it's just not realistic. So how did you eventually land at the manufacturer? How'd you find them? For someone who's in your position, like what was the step that helped you finally locate that, that match we, for you? We just Googled, I mean, basically Google pill manufacturers in the U.S., and then we would just make calls. We just started making calls, calls, calls. And it was the ones that would call back. And then we would get samples. And then the sam, you know, the thing was having the perfect pillow because the way the pillow works um, with that middle section is it flips up uh, for back support. And, and the way the pillow is, it, it has to be really stuffed well. So a lot of the pillow manufacturers are used to just stuffing a pillow and it's not solid. So we were finding that we were having troubles getting the exact amount of fill, um, the exact shape, the buckled way. So there's just a lot of back and forth um, with prototypes. And I think that's why it took us so many manufacturers, too, because, you know, we had to have a lot of fill in this pillow. It's a big pillow. And, um, and we had to keep our costs down, too. So, you know, we just made a lot of phone call, a lot of phone calls and, and finally found somebody that, that worked well for us. So no agent, no rep, you just kind of did it on your own, huh? Oh, yeah, we did it ourselves, yeah. I got to tell you, I'll put in there for a second and say, I mean, Michelle has done absolutely everything on her. She built her own website. Um, she learned how to do code. I mean, she literally, she's done her own marketing. She's never once hired a firm or done anything. It's, it's from day one, everything she's done has been completely on her own. <laughs> I'm trying not to say anything I shouldn't. I have another podcast I do that's kind of a political pop culture podcast and this whole thing about, you know, women in the marketplace. I'm like, if any guy who's married to a great woman knows all that's nonsense, like women are <laughs> there. And Jason, you're going to feel me here, right? Like they can do anything they want to do. You just have to, you just have to like, let go of the leash and let them go. Like, I don't doubt that for a second. <laughs> It's 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 amazing to watch them work. And Jason, and I joked before the segment, this really should be about early retirement for men because this new economy, the sharing economy, the online community, like the women rule this environment, no questions asked. So it's really Absolutely. it's really about us finding the right kind of leisure time and and life balance and things like that, isn't it? If if I were the one starting this business, it would not be halfway where it is today because I would keep complaining how exhausted I was and it just wouldn't get done. So yeah. Meanwhile, she's pushing you out of the way. So easy, lightweight. I got this. So what the heck were you doing, Michelle? Why were you doing your own coding? Like there's so many good ways to build a website. What's, what's, do you just not know any better? Or are you just like, my mom takes the weight well, of the world on her shoulder. She's like Atlas, right? Is that, is that your personality or were you just, you like to know a little bit about everything? No, no, I didn't really want to. I just think it was just the only option as far as cost wise. We weren't trying to spend a lot of money till we, and I think the biggest thing you know, I always tell new people is like, try not to spend more money than you need to spend up front because you want to prove the concept first. Like you want to make sure somebody actually likes the product. You know, you may think it's the greatest product ever, but you know, when you actually put it out in the marketplace, people may think differently. So we really were trying to not spend a lot of money up front. Not that I wanted to learn coding or anything because that is not my thing, but I did it just really out of necessity. And um, I basically took, Staples software. It was like 30 bucks software and put it on the, on the computer. That was my initial website. I don't awesome. have that one anymore, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, just built it with that. And, and now I use big commerce. I really like them a lot. Um, and they, they make it very easy for integration and all that kind of stuff. But I still do all of that myself. Very interesting. So the valid, I mean, amen to what you said earlier, validation. I meet people all the time on the a podcast just via email on the website, whatever. And they'll say, I've been sitting on this idea for years. I've been working on this prototype for years. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't say this. I'm thinking, why? Like sell five of them. And if you can't do that, don't waste any more time because if, even if it's the cure to cancer, like maybe you're not the right person for it. And if you sell five, sell 10, if you sell 10, sell 20, then. I, I say that, I, you know, what I always tell people is that with the internet now, anybody can sell anything. So there's really no, you know, holding anybody back. I mean, unless they need something that's made, you know, in China with molds and that kind of stuff. But if you have a product that you can physically make in the U.S., then you can make a small amount, no matter what the cost is. You know, if you make a, a tiny margin on it just to start, 
then, you know, with, with Amazon and the internet, anybody can sell anything. It's just amazing nowadays. Well, we definitely want to talk about your retail experience and where and why you're selling where you are, but we have to squeeze in Shark Tank here. Let's talk about how you got on the show. You mentioned to me in pregame that someone had mentioned, I think it was Jason's boss, mentioned they were doing a casting call in your area in Boston. So is this something that you had decided it was predetermined you were going to do it at some point and you're just waiting for an opportunity or did it kind of creep up on you? No, I think, I think we... We were avid Shark Tank watchers forever, and we had always kind of just thrown it out there. And, you know, it was kind of like, well, if the opportunity ever presented itself, and we never really were going after it. I think the company at that point was doing really well, so I don't feel like we needed it. Um, but when his, bro- his boss brought it up, I said, well, why not? You know, we might as well try. And uh, we went to an open casting call in Boston, and it was freezing, literally freezing. We had to you know, stand outside for hours. They ended up starting it early because everybody was out in sub zero, not sub zero, but under 30 degree weather. Right. And, um, you know, you go in, you get your 60 second pitch and, um, and then you hope for a call back. (laughs) And we did, we were, you know, we were very lucky. We got a call back and, um, you know, had to do the whole process, which I'm sure you've heard a million times. Oh yeah. Was it bumpy at all or was it pretty smooth as far as doing the video, doing the callback, Um, signing the contract? it was very long. Um, I think it was pretty smooth. It's just, you know, it's kind of the unknown, I think, when you're going into it. Um, you know, they ask you for the next video and, you know, the next documents they need. It's just a very long process. I think much more likely lengthy than I expected. Um, but I think for us, you know, we we were just doing it as gravy, so we didn't need it. So I think for us, we could, we could kind of just go with it. Um, Whereas I think if the business was relying on it, I, I would have been a lot more stressed about it. Yeah, which is ironic. I think part of the reason you did so well in the Shark Tank is you had that era of, well, you know, take it or leave it. We're doing awesome, and we we don't really need to be here. It's kind of like getting a bank loan, right? If you can prove you don't need it, then anyone will give you one. Yeah, and I think that was one of our goals, too, is like we just wanted to go on there and, and show that we have a really great product and that we, you know, we basically we love our moms. We love our Facebook group. I mean, now we have the onesie pillow. And so we really just wanted to portray our company really well. And I think that was really important to us, um, you know, and making sure that whatever happened and however it flushed out, that we just came off, um, you know, that we really cared about our, our parents and our moms. Because it's really important to us. I mean, they really make or break our business. Hey, so Jason, I have a question for you. When it came to Shark Tank, were you taking an active role or was it more of what we talked about earlier where you're like, honey, there's the target. Charge! You know, you're, and you're just staying in the trench. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that I, I always have a lot of ideas. Um, like I had come to her when my boss had called to do it. And, you know, I would say that I was a uh, active participant. <laughs> Is what I would say that I was. He is the supportive, uh, the support behind me. <laughs> I couldn't do it without him, but I probably do more than him. <laughs> well, no, you guys seem like you're a great team, and I think in the negotiation, he he was very instrumental in kind of moving it along in the direction now that it looks like you wanted it to go, which is pretty awesome. But we had done a lot of talking prior. We had, we had done a ton of of talking prior about the numbers and what we were looking for and what we would not settle for. So we were very prepared with our numbers, and we knew exactly what we were looking for to get. Um, I mean, basically, Michelle had grown it to a point where she was in on that fence of, of going retail or not going retail and getting so big that she was sort of looking for a mentor um, to sort of point us in the right direction. And what was interesting on the show was half of them wanted us to go retail, and the other half were like, stay away from retail. Yep. So that was an interesting, interesting dilemma. Well, let's run. I've got some of the uh, concerns and offers written down here. So I want to discuss them. Before we do that, I also want to get an idea of the growth and scale of your business. So you started in 2012. By the time we're here in what, like 2014, you're projecting 510,000 in sales. Did you grow pretty steadily or were you in the middle of an Al Gore type hockey stick period of growth? We were growing. We were doubling every nine months. Okay. So... So the first, what did you do the did, first year? Uh, first year, I don't know. Uh, that was negative, wasn't it? I mean, we ended up not making. Well, it depends what you claim on your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about gro- so, gross sales. Gross sales. I think two thousand. I'm just kidding. I think <laughs> that was funny. Twelve was. I think twelve was sixty thousand. Yeah, somewhere around sixty thousand. Yeah. I think thirteen was hundred and 
thirty. Somewhere right around. Right around there. Right around there. Yeah. yeah. And then fourteen. Uh, we it was five ten. Well. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, 5, 10, 14, yeah. And then this year, then this yeah, year yeah, we're this probably year. on track to do 1.2, 1.3. Okay, so your projection for this year that you gave on the show is still pretty accurate, right? Absolutely, yes. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, we I think we have projected that for 2016. So that was for 15. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, but then I'm guessing you were factoring in the Shark Tank effect to some degree then if you hit it spot on, which is still over a million yeah, dollars. Yeah. Phenomenal. Well, we never knew when that was going to air because we filmed in September. September of, of last year. 14. Yep. September. Yep. All right, so let's get to the negotiation. Obviously, the you did a really good job presenting. You had the intro segment. You talked about your mom passing away, which, uh, sorry to hear, obviously. But, you Thank know, as you. far as TV and the segment and the way that they edited it, I mean, it just it came together very powerfully. And how you're, she got to live to see the girls. And then you basically got the sharks totally invested in your story and in your passion. And then you start yeah. dropping the numbers on them. And Kevin brought up a pretty good... Objection, first off, when he said, we have to sell the people with twins, which is a subset of a subset, and they have to be having babies. And I know it was yeah. uh, Jason who responded back with the number of people that have twins. I think it was like 135,000 a year or something like that. Yeah, it's just in the U.S. Uh, yeah, in, the, in the world, it's about $4 million a year. And uh, right. yeah, to me, it's such, it, it really is amazing how many people are having twins, and it's just singleton pillow. And that's the one thing, if we could have had that be on Shark Tank, that would have, I mean, that that would have been fantastic. Yeah, is that the, the onesie or is the singleton a different product? Just for clarification. Yeah, yeah the, one, the onesie pillow. Yep, the okay. onesie but pillow. Comes singleton yeah, and, and right after we aired on Shark Tank, we had so many moms email us saying that we want a pill that has that same back support that the twins he had. And we had already been, we had already knew it was coming out. We just hadn't had it fully ready yet. And, um, and that was the one thing, if I could have had the onesie pillow out before Shark Tank, that would have just been really fantastic. I mean, the market is 30 times. A lot of people bring in really junky prototypes of products they're working on. Was that a thought that you had of just showing people that it was available or did you want to stay away from that because it was not quite ready? Well, it wasn't quite right ready. And I didn't, you know, we didn't have numbers on it with enough sales on it. And we didn't, you know how if, if you don't have some data on it, it just may, you know, make everything jumbled. Yeah. So we kind of wanted to keep it clean when we went in there. Um, yeah. Oh, the patent hadn't been filed. That's ah, what it was. There you go. Yeah, the patent been filed. Yeah, yeah. That's so, right. yeah, you always know you have that window if you, in fact, film. But I thought Kevin's concern was probably the best one that came out during the TV segment of, well, you know, if, if I don't have twins, what do I buy from you? And now you've answered that question. So, you know, we have three boys. My wife is still breastfeeding our third. And she has this pillow. Sorry, it's not. It's a competitor because we didn't know about yours at the time. But it's more of a pregnancy yeah. pillow than a breastfeeder. If she's still breastfeeding, I can send her one. Uh, we'd lo- I'm sure she would love that. I haven't seen the onesie, but I'm definitely going to post pictures of it here on the on the podcast because I think it looks awesome. Yeah. Or the twinsie does. If she's still breastfeeding. I'll send her one. Well, yeah, she's got absolutely. this pillow that looks like a... What's nice is after she's breastfeeding, she can still use the pillow for when they start sitting up on their own, for story time, for tummy time. You, there's so many different options because most breastfeeding pillows, once you're done breastfeeding, you throw the pillow away. And you know, Jason, you're kind of making the point I was getting on. She has this pregnancy pillow and it's this long snake gummy worm looking thing with a little hook at each end. <laughs> And when she was sleeping yeah. with it, she would literally wrap herself up in it like a cartoon. But the rest of the time that we have it, it just takes up a ton of storage in the garage or wherever she puts it. Twin moms buy the twinsy pillow when they're pregnant and they use it as a pregnancy pillow. Then they use it for breastfeeding. Then they use it for bottle feeding. Then they use it for tummy time. Then they use it for support. Then they use it just to have their babies lounge in it. So literally, and if you look on Amazon or wherever, they sell a pregnancy pillow. They sell a lounger. They sell a breastfeeding pillow. They sell a bottle feeding pillow. It's literally every single thing you need in one pillow. I love it. This is like an infomercial. I'm pulling out my credit card right now. In fact, yeah, if, if you send me one, if you send me one, it's not just going to be breastfeeding. It's going to be like a hair club for men commercial. We're going to start taking it to the lake, jet skiing, water skiing, horseback riding. It's going everywhere. It's like yeah. your family dog. Yeah. <laughs> So tell me about the, I mean, obviously you have Shark Tank bolstering the Twin Z, but has the One Z, has it been one of these products where it's actually overshadowed the original product? Is it on par? I mean, how successful has it been? We've only launched it since uh, late July of this year. So we're only about four or five months in, but it's already growing 
uh, a lot quicker than the Twinsy grew. Like we're to the point now where it took two years for Twinsy to be in four months. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's outpacing in terms of. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And we're thinking you. about taking this on retail. So that's kind of, I think the difference we are talking about, you know, retail versus online. I think Twinsy is a very online product. I think we have a, a huge network of moms online. We have a, a huge following. But I think when you come to moms with one baby, there's so many products out there. And I think that the ones he's going to do a lot better. We've been in talks with Bye Bye Baby about the Twinsy for a while. And I, so I think we're going to, uh, to approach the onesie for, for retail. Yeah. It's more ubiquitous in terms of the customer base and the retail appeal. I, I, and it's also diversifying your business in terms of you've got one that's a rock solid online niche product and another one you're doing in retail and down the road, you've got both outlets. Now you can use to distribute whatever you come up with. I it's, it's a masterful plan. I'm sure it was yours, Jason. Nice job. Well, way to yeah. pick all this <laughs> Thank you very much. I had to convince him that we had two different business models. <laughs> Interesting. I'm just along for the ride, TJ. Come on. Hey, I, you're my hero, man. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna put a <laughs> picture of you up on the wall in my office. So uh, let's talk. Let's go back to my list here. Mark Cuban, you're amazing entrepreneurs. It's not a fit for what I do, but you're, you're, you know, you're inspirational. You're the reason we do Shark Tank. That must have made you feel pretty good, even though he was saying that as he exited. And I'm gonna play that clip oh, in the intro so people can hear. Yeah, it. he, he actually, he even went. Oh, oh, above and beyond what was aired. I mean, he 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 was very very complimentary, and we we very much appreciated that. How many has he ordered? I guess he doesn't have any little kids. Huh? I'm not. That's not fair. I'm just teasing. That's right. Uh, <laughs> so this is where the retail discussion started in this debate, and this is one I have with my clients very often, right? Because you don't want to screw this up. But Robert Herjavec you know what? Don't go retail. You're making money. It doesn't make any sense. You're opening a can of worms. Barbara Corcoran, I disagree. I can easily see this in retail. Kevin, no, 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 no retail. He did a <laughs> he did a clip one time where he talked about retail being the siren song, right? Where the sailor comes and then drowns. And uh, that always sticks on my mind. And then Lori said, yes, it's absolutely the right play. You'll double or triple your money and be everywhere. And then it got a little messy after that. So before you guys give, we've kind of talked about retail already, but this is where I thought it got really interesting is I did a coaching segment for people going on season seven and we coached like a dozen entrepreneurs, essentially a mock shark tank to help them prepare. Were you prepared for every single shark except for Barbara to make you a royalty offer? I mean, where did that come from? No, I think we were shocked about the, the, all the royalties. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it got a little bit much, too, like understanding what each one meant and to be thinking about it so quickly. I think we had gone in knowing we weren't going to do a royalty deal, but going back, looking, you know, Lori's original royalty deal was not actually a bad deal at all. No, it wasn't. Um, yeah, no, yeah. The funny thing is, I don't even remember that deal being on the table. I. I feel like I saw that deal the first time when I watched the show. Cause I'm like, why didn't we take that deal? <laughs> And the funny thing about Lori, and there's criticism about this, and I I watch every show, right? So you see it. But one time on the show, it was either Kevin or Mark criticized her for being unoriginal, for copying deals. And she did that twice on the show. She copied a royalty deal, and then she copied Barbara's equity offer. Yeah, that's right. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had to laugh because now you're saying the deal wasn't that bad. I think if it were me and I'm hearing all these royalties, the only way I could categorize them is better or worse. No, that's worse than the last one. That's better than the last one. Like, it's exactly. It's, that's yeah, it. Yeah. It's as complicated yeah. as I could. It's as simple as I could make it. And hers was the best one. Yeah, and actually, Mark uh, Cuban was actually helping us a little bit. I was asking him questions, like, "What do you think about this, Mark?" Because Mark was already out, and he was just—he was fantastic. He's—he's he's a great guy, and and uh, I—he he said, "Don't do that. Don't do that." And I said, well, "What do you think of this one, Mark?" You know. <laughs> well, I'm sure that drove them crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little sideline coach. All right, so just to rehash, Kevin started $75,000 offer, a $10 royalty until I get triple my investment back, or $225,000, plus 2.5% just to get me interested in this, you know, however Kevin says it. Robert Herjavec says, well, I've learned how to do equity deals now sitting here for six years and made exactly the same offer, except you only had to pay back double the investment, which for a royalty deal to me in the industry, I think we're getting more realistic in terms of what's reasonable. And Lori said $150,000 with a $5 royalty until I get the exact same investment back, $150,000 plus 5%. It's true. For where you guys were at with the cash flow you had, really not a bad deal to get the mentor and you're giving up 5%. That, but that deal went away very quickly. 
don't know why. You don't. You don't know that. You don't even remember again. I was. You're saying the the time <laughs> elapsed was so yeah, short. Exactly. Yeah. Were, yeah. <laughs> I think the end is that funny. <laughs> you think that was a post op, Lori? Make an act, make a royalty deal. We'll cut it in. So then Barbara offers 75% for 20, I'm sorry, 75,000 for 20% equity. She made a comment about how every 10% deal she makes starts to look smaller and smaller over time, which I had to laugh. She's kind of knocking on some of her existing deals that she's made. And she feels like she's going to have to work very hard to get into retail and she's going to be a long-term partner. She's playing the angle of you need a partner. That's why you're here. I can be that person. And then Kevin makes the observation that retail will eat up half the margin and tie up all your capital. Barbara says, These on, only this deal makes sense. None of the other ones have skin in the game. And Mark Cuban said, royalty deals make no sense if you're capital constrained, which I don't think at this point I would put you in the category of capital constrained, but maybe I missed some of the negotiation. No. So, correct. That was edited a bit because he said, unless you're capital restrained, and then he said, which you're not, so this could be a good deal. And then he said, so it's your job now is to negotiate is what he said. Which you did. And now the other thing you did is you kept, at least on TV, you kept everyone in the deal, right? Which some of the really smart entrepreneurs, Grace and Lace comes to mind. They kept everyone on the edge of a sword until they made their decision, which is kind of how you're shook out on TV. Lori asked Barbara to come in with her. And then Barbara said she's going it alone. And eventually you agreed to take Lori's second offer for equity. Tell us what we missed. Tell us how you got there. Tell us maybe what you would do differently. I think basically we had sort of gone in there, like I said, we weren't looking for money at that point with the, with the company. We were looking for someone to sort of be a mentor for us. And um, we, we knew Lori had the relationship with Bye Bye Baby. Correct. So, so that's kind of what we had in the back of our mind. And they had already called you, right? They had already contacted you and said they were interested. They had already, yeah, they had already contacted us, but we thought maybe she could negotiate um, a little better than we could. Makes sense. So had, was this a decision, Jason, was the decision kind of already made? Did you guys have to negotiate on site or were you kind of just like Morse coding no, each other with your fingers? Second, we did take a second. We took a second. They didn't show it on TV. We did ask to step out for about a minute. So we stepped out and we sort of talked about it. And we basically said, we'll go with either Barbara. Because the guy's royalty deals, we're talking about paying back double, triple the, the money. And we didn't want to go down that road. And plus it was like $10 a pillow and then it was $7 a pillow. So we said, okay, we're going to probably go with either Barbara or Lori, whoever will come down to the 15% first. And they both came down to the 15%, the way I saw it. Well, I was going to say, Barbara, Barbara technically came down first. Correct. And then Lori came down right after. And then between the two, I think we you know, we were assuming the relationship with, with Lori and Bye Bye Baby. Correct. So yeah. technically there were three times where Lori just uh, offer copied in that show. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Lori. Yeah, it was Kevin who accused her of having no originality. She copies all of my deals. Uh, so, but, and then what happens is after the show, you're actually no longer partnered with Lori, which I think is interesting because this happens a lot. I just wrote an article on entrepreneur.com about this expectation that every date should lead to marriage on Shark Tank, which is totally ridiculous in my opinion. Like the actual close rates under 30%, which I think is reasonable. And you came in for a mentor. You wanted Lori. You would have got a mentor. You would have gotten into retail. Where did things kind of, what what happened? Where was the decision made that it was best for you to part ways? I think we had, when we stepped off the stage, we talked really um, in depth about how strong the other two sharks felt about not going retail, how they really were we're saying, look, it can sink a business. And so I think we really took that to heart. And so now we're looking at, you know, do we want to do retail? Do we not want to do retail? And I think we came to the conclusion with, with Twinsy that it was not a retail product at this point with the way we were manufacturing in the U.S. And we really wanted to keep it a U.S. product. I mean, we've kind of stood by that. I think it, it's very hard to make the pillows as big as they are over China and, and ship them over. So we really wanted to keep the quality and keep it in the U.S. So that we kind of came back to, do we want to do retail? Do we not? And if we're not doing retail, you know, what does that mean? So um, I think, you know, negotiations, there's a lot that happens on, as you know, you know, after you step off the stage, it's, you know, that's TV and then there's real life. And <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, the deal, when we came back, it wasn't the same. So at that point, when the negotiations were going on, the company had grown so much more that, you know, the evaluation we did on TV would have had to even be adjusted the other way for our favor. Um, and so we didn't, the numbers just didn't come out right. 
And so it, we ended up just not, you know, not going that way. Yeah. And you said something really important that one, if, and this happens a lot. I mean, I talked to everyone, if the thing is, if you're getting a deal, if the sharks are competing to win you over and they're doing the copy deal, like Lori was doing, you should expect the deal to change after the deals went over. And I see this on season seven. There's Chris Saka got beat out of a deal by the STEM girls. I don't know if you still watch the show or not. A lot of old shark tank entrepreneurs don't watch it anymore. But oh, we do. We do, yeah. Did you see the STEM one? Because that was a copy deal situation. And I'm thinking, man, they have no idea that that deal is going to totally I don't know, change. I don't remember that. One. What was that called? The, the what deal? There was STEM engineering or STEM innovation. It was the two girls oh, from Stanford. Okay. They were engineers, beautiful girls, very smart. And Chris, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Now I do. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Saka wanted to work with him and Lori and he negotiated their deal down and she went super low to get the deal. I think it was 5% and they took Lori's yeah. deal over Chris's and Chris said, I've got daughters. I'm motivated by this. I'm the Google guy. Correct. Like, I remember that. Yep. Everything fit in place. And they went, they, they went girl power. They took Lori and I thought they have no idea. Like this is, they're going to be so disappointed. <laughs> Not because Lori's not a great partner, because that deal is not going to go through. It's going to change because they were deal com- they were deal copying yeah. to get it to win on TV. Right. And right. Um, after talking to a bunch of different other entrepreneurs that have been on the show and worked with different people, I think if we could go back and change things, and at the point if we had the onesie pillow, I bet you we would have probably made a deal with Barbara, and I bet you we probably would have closed it. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to think who I just interviewed that was Barbara's partner, and they just went on and on about how great she is. And Lori's, I've interviewed most of them. Well, we hear, and we we looked back at the show, and she seemed pretty disappointed. And like you said, Lori kept copying, and then we sort of had something in our head and went that way. Um, But we've heard so many lovely things about Barbara, and um, I just think she would have probably made a great partner. Wow, that's quite an, uh, quite an admission. I think she'll be pleased to hear that. I'll make sure that she does. Have you talked with her at all? Have you ever collaborated or gotten advice or just stayed in contact with her or any of the other sharks? Yeah, we thought about reaching out to her, but we're sort of busy launching that, that uh, second product. And um, I bet you at some point we'll reach out. Yeah, you should. I've, uh, I've, I've had a lot of people ask if they think it's smart to do that, and especially if a deal, you know, if they were that close to doing a deal and then they didn't. They're like, oh, we've never spoken, but we should. I'm like, what is it going to hurt? Just do it. Yeah. yeah, that's what we thought. I think she'd be a fantastic partner. She seems really, really involved with her entrepreneur. Yeah, I'd go through. If you've made friends with her team, I'd, I'd approach it that way because they, again, most of the successful entrepreneurs from every team are so open about how well they get along and how well they work together, and they usually are up for doing that. But, but thanks for sharing that. That was pretty interesting, so I'm going to make a note of that. Let's see. I know you guys got to pick up your kids real quick. Are they waiting outside the car, banging on the windows? No, we're sitting at, yeah, we're sitting at the bus stop. <laughs> I'm picturing. The bus will be pulling up any second. <laughs> I'm picturing the Forrest Gump stump and the the flying feather, and you two just sitting there waiting for the bus. But so, bye bye, baby. You're gonna go retail with onesie. Let, let's talk about the Shark Tank tsunami. You mentioned during the conversation that the numbers changed and that the conversation shifted. Were you prepared for the? Tidal wave? Did you sell like crazy? What did you learn from it? How did your business change? Kind of just lay it all on us. We were definitely prepared, and it is. And what, I think what I was so impressed with was yes, you get that right after the airing, you get all these orders, 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 but then it maintained. That's the part that I was surprised about that it maintained, and it's not like you fell back to where you were. We never, we never looked back after the, the sort like you say, the Shark Tank tsunami. What was the secret of scaling and growing this online community? Is it just your interaction with them? Michelle, or is it something, what else are you doing to? I, I think, you know, we do, we talk, we try to talk to our customers and our moms every day on Facebook, you know, which I'm sure, you know, most entrepreneurs do, but I think it's active, getting active with those people and making sure that we can provide good information for them. We can be a resource for them. We, we try to, you know, make sure if moms have questions about having twins, we post those. And I think there's just a lot of valuable information that we try to uh, interchange between the moms. And I think also really working with our mommy bloggers, working with our multiples groups. We've been working with lactation consultants in the hospitals. So I think a combination of all of that has really has really made it successful. What was the middle thing you said? The multiplier multiples groups? Is that like an affiliate yeah. group? 
Yeah, so the, all, all over the country, there's um, local groups that are, um, you know, moms of multiples, and basically it's, oh, okay. you know, twin organizations, yeah. um, and they all just get together. It's basically moms groups, but specifically for multiples, and they're all over the country, and so we've dealt with them one-on-one, um, and basically if they have a, you know, a giveaway or if they have an event, we do door prizes. We try to um, to make sure that, you know, they always have, a, you know, a pillow on hand. And we've done, like, a lot of donations for hospitals, um, for patients that, you know, can't afford a pillow. Um, we've done a lot of that kind of stuff, too. And so the, then you also become kind of the conduit or link between all these different multiples groups, right? You're kind of the hub they can come to to communicate and expand their own reach, right? Because I'm sure a lot of these people are now in your Facebook community, and they become lifelong members of, of the cause, right? Yeah, they do. You guys can come in. Jesus, Jesus getting the kids in the car. <laughs> no sweat. We're about done. But no, I, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's fantastic. We have, I mean, now we have moms that have four-year-olds. And, you know, some of them will actually still be using their, their pillows, so it's crazy. And they're trying, they're doing in vitro to try to have another set of twins so they can buy another twins. Uh, right? I don't know how many moms do that, though. <laughs> Tell me about the uh, what's working for you in terms of growing your social media. This is a hot button for everybody. Like, what's helping you grow the community? Is it contests? Is it collaboration? Is it influencers? Like, what's the most effective thing that you do to continue to grow the community? Um, I think we're constantly doing um, contests. We do we do monthly contests. We do like stroller giveaways. We do um, Amazon gift cards, Babies R Us gift cards. But we always try to have. We don't do a lot of advertising, so I always think of my advertising budget as going back into the moms because really the moms are the ones that are spreading it to the other moms, uh, you know, about the pillow and, you know, how you have to have this when you've got multiples. And so we try to invest our advertising money back into our moms. Yeah, and I, th- yeah, as far as incentivizing the moms to get them to spread the word, do you do uh, affiliates? Do you give them coupon codes? Like, how do you, you have those certain moms that just can't stop talking about your product. How do you focus on them and, and help them do what they're doing for you? Uh, we do a lot of coupons. And we, you know, we have just had great moms. We, we used to have an affiliate program with our old um, software, our old comp- um, website, but we don't have it with the, with the new website. But I have to say, like, our moms are just fantastic. I mean, they have, they want to help us, you know, just, just help us, really. I mean, a lot of them haven't really asked for anything in return. Um, but we do try to, you know, make a network where they can ask other moms, you know, questions as their twins grow. Because there's a lot of questions when you have multiples. Like, do you keep them in the same classroom? You know, do they have different teachers, uh, different kind of car seats? So there's there's a lot of things with two kids at the same age that we try to provide a resource, you know, for those moms. Yeah. You're almost like the yellow dummies book for twin parents, right? I mean, you guys could be a reality <laughs> TV show. <laughs> I'd like to think that <laughs> we try to be. It's a lot of work in the beginning. These moms, I've talked to a lot of these moms on the phone and you know, they're scared, they're nervous. Um, they want to know that everything's going to be okay. You know, and, and, uh, so, so yeah, we've been a good resource, I think, for that. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, our kids are all about two years apart. There's three of them. And I'd be, that's to me, I'd be terrified if they were even 10 months apart. So having them <laughs> 10 yeah, seconds apart lot. is, it's a lot I of work. Imagine. Yeah. So I, you know, it's been really informative. I think all this information is awesome. The segment was great. I just love the fact that your business has grown and you can inspire others to show them how to do something similar and really empower them too. I can speak from experience with my own wife who didn't really have the confidence that she could build a product or anybody would care or know the know-how to build her own site or go to Staples and buy it in a box or whatever you've done. But there is one other area I want to touch on and that's Amazon. You decided not to go retail. Amazon technically is the largest retailer on the planet now, but you've gone ahead and moved forward on Amazon and you've told me that it's been quite successful for you. So for people who are selling on Amazon or who are new to it, kind of give us your tips and tricks or to do's of selling on Amazon. Uh, I can't say enough great things about Amazon. I think, you know, everybody has started, not everybody, but a lot of people have started selling, buying online. Like I did my whole Christmas shopping online this year. Totally. And I think Amazon is just a powerhouse. I mean, there's just so many people on Amazon. And I think the resources that I find, you know, as a consumer is that there's so many reviews that you can really see different products. Like, I'll go on a website, but I go on Amazon to see the reviews. There's just such a huge volume of people, and they can influence so many other people. So I think for Amazon, it, it has been a huge, huge for us. Um, we have 
so many moms that have gone back on after they purchased for Amazon and have left reviews for us. And that that has made it very successful, as very successful on Amazon. I, I can't say enough great things um, about Amazon. I, I think every business should be on it or you're missing the boat. Yeah, they do a ton of marketing for you. I mean, all those fees that oh, you yeah. pay them, it's not that bad. But they do tons and tons and tons of marketing for you. Do you use their Amazon ads or do you just post and... No, they well, we, we, we do some... With the new products, we have. Because with, the product, yeah. with the new products, we have, yeah. Uh, with our old product, no, we, we don't. Because it takes a while. I mean, once you get on Amazon, it's not like you just throw your... You know, you throw your product on there and all of a sudden sales are going crazy. It takes a while, you know, for you to get up in the rankings, you get, you know, um, testimonials and stuff like that. So for the new product, we have done a little bit of advertising, but for Twinsy, we, we really have not. Yeah, they do the advertising for us on their own. Yeah, there's a lot of ads that pop up. Well, I'm sure we could go on for a while. I think the uh, the social media platform is of interest to anyone who's selling their product, but, for, but it's time to call it. So why don't you tell everyone where they can go to get the onesie or the twinsie and to follow you on social media. Yeah. So the, um, so twinsie is, um, www.twinsiepillow, T-W-I-N-Z, hello, P-I-L-L-O-W.com. And then the onesie pillow is just one O-N-E, Z, pillow.com. And that's www.onesiepillow.com. And then on Facebook, we're onesie pillow and, and twinsie pillow. And since you're going retail with the onesie and it's a smaller pillow, is that, I mean, people don't think that typically that forces them to make the product overseas because you've got to get the cost down to account for the lower margin. Is that something you're going to source overseas or are you going to try to keep that in the States as well, even at volume? No. No, we're still, we're still in the U.S. Um, you know, we'll probably, we're, we're going to take a lot less margin on it. Um, but we're going to keep it in the U.S., and that's kind of, you know, we're kind of sticking by that. So It's a baby product. You know, most of the products are made overseas, and when it comes to baby products, I think making it here in the U.S., I think, is very important. Well, I uh, was not disappointed by this interview. YouTube has been fantastic. I hope that people will go and become a part of your community, especially the moms out there, and learn from your experience as far as growing your business and uh, doing right by the customer. I love the fact that you're keeping the baby products here because – we got three little dudes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Best of luck to you. Is there going to be an update or a Beyond the Tank in the works? I know you didn't go through with your deal, so the odds are lower, but has there been any contact from the uh, the Shark Tank gods up in their ivory towers? We uh, we have not heard anything, but, you know, if, if we ever got the opportunity, we'd jump on it. <laughs> we did get a call from the main, uh, from the director, and he wanted to compliment us on, on the show. Uh, he, he, he told a funny story. He said, you know, when you guys were sort of coming in to do taping, you were you guys were sort of on the fence for us. And he said, goes to show how much we know. He's like, your episode is one of the best. So honestly, that was that's nice for him to reach out. Awesome. Was that uh, was that Clay? Was that Fuchs? Who Clay. was that? Was it it's Clay? Yep. Wow. Good for you. That's quite an honor. And I have to agree yeah. with them. Some of the people they put on TV, I'm, I just scratch my head. So it's true. They really don't know that much about me. They know TV. They know business. <laughs> We're not saying that, though. <laughs> no, that was all me. We, we'll got, take every opportunity to get back on there. We, they know what they're doing somewhat. <laughs> they do. We'll but I've got to the pillow and make a deal with Barbara. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll forward the podcast with a note to her assistant. But you two should definitely reach out to her. I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. Bottom line, she's Barbara's fun. Like some of the sharks aren't that fun. Barbara is hilarious fun. I don't know if you listened to the session where I had her on. Like I, I could have talked to her yes, all day. She was awesome. Yeah, oh, she's hilarious. So that would be a big one for me. If it, if she wasn't fun, it'd be a deal breaker. So I'm sure you guys should get back in touch. Yeah, yeah. We'd love to work with somebody fun. <laughs> well, Michelle and Jason, congratulations on all the success. Say thank you to your kids in the backseat for making all this possible. And I appreciate you jumping into the podcast. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys, you guys are amazing entrepreneurs. Thank right? you. Thank you. You guys man. are the American dream and deserve everything that you've earned. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you for the kind thank words. You. Oh, no, you earned it. Thank you for jumping in to the Shark Tank Podcast. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and head over to sharktankpodcast.net to get the show notes from each episode and join the free Shark Tank Insiders list. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Shark Tank Podcast and on Twitter at Shark Tank PDcast.